at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Uh, Jake has done this a couple times in D.C., right? Yes, a couple times. A couple times in D.C., and uh, I've heard a lot about it, so I wanted to bring it up here and uh, allow you all to see this, and I'm going to get to see it for the first time as well. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to get Jake Wynn to start uh, the process. So Jake, thanks for coming, and yeah. have fun. Thank you, John. Thank you all for being here. This is a uh, a great crowd. I was wondering how this looked. This is my uh, my first chance to uh, to come and see one of John's programs. The Tattooed Historian does does great stuff online here at the Gary Owen. So I'm really excited to be able to be here and to present this evening and do one of my favorite programs that I do for the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. So I always like to start these programs. Uh, by asking all of you, how many of you have been to the National Museum of Civil War Medicine before? Show of hands. All right. Cool. All right. So I always like to say at the end of this program, I hope that I have not scared those of you who haven't been to the museum away. I hope that I I invite you and, and entice you to come out to see our museum, which is located in downtown Frederick, Maryland, so just down 15, um, right in historic downtown, which is having a, a real renaissance at the moment. So if you haven't been to Frederick lately, definitely go, down, go on down there. Uh, great food, great beer, whiskey, uh, great shopping, but most importantly, great history. Uh, Frederick has uh, incredible Civil War history. Um, it was home to um, dozens of Civil War hospitals, um, more almost 30 buildings used uh, in Frederick in the aftermath of the Battle of Antietam in 1862 to care for wounded soldiers, mostly Union soldiers, um, from that particular battle. Um, but our museum is dedicated to telling the story of Civil War medical care. Uh, and one of our mottos for the museum, one of our taglines is, Civil War medicine, it's not what you think. Um, there are so many myths and misconceptions associated with medical care during the American Civil War, especially when it comes to battlefield medicine. And that's what we're going to get into this evening. We're going to talk a little bit about how medical care has kind of gotten a bad rap when it comes to the Civil War. Uh, there are a, a lot of horrors associated with Civil War medicine. I'm sure many of you are familiar with them. Um, no germ theory. Don't understand germ theory. Um, very little in the way of sanitation. Uh, most of the disease, and disease kills more soldiers than, than uh, injuries during the war, is caused by poor sanitation. Diarrhea, dysentery, kills more soldiers during the Civil War than just about anything else. Um, so what medical care is like during this, this time period, it's, it's very complex. And so we're going to talk through some of that um, before we get into the main part of the program, which I'm sure is what enticed all of you to come out this evening. I'm going to show you how Civil War surgeons amputated limbs. And specifically, we're going to amputate a femur this evening. Um, I have a, a surgical grade training tool from sawbones.com. You can buy your own encased femur if you want to uh, try this at home. I don't encourage that. Um, it costs $150. Um, but uh, I'm going to show you how Civil War surgeons did Amputations, which is the most common surgical operation of the American Civil War. More than 60,000 of them are performed during the conflict. Uh, and by the end of the war, Civil War surgeons are really, really good at them. And in fact, many of the, the ways in which they performed an amputation are still the way surgeons would perform an amputation with similar injuries today. So we'll talk through some of that as well. But before we do that, I want to kind of 
paint the picture of where we are medically uh, when the Civil War breaks out. So the American Civil War takes place at a really important pivot point in medical history. So mid-1800s, medicine is just on the cusp of some really major advances, but it's not quite there yet. So there are uh, medical professionals in Europe at the time of the outbreak of the Civil War who are on the verge of making some major discoveries. These are folks with last names that may be familiar to some of you. Um, Koch in Germany, uh, Louis Pasteur in France, uh, and then you have, most importantly when it comes to surgery, Joseph Lister in Scotland. Those three gentlemen and a number of other uh, medical professionals in, in Europe at the time are making some big advances and big inroads in the 1860s in things like germ theory and antiseptic surgical techniques. But at the time of the Civil War in America, we're still a long way off from those medical revolutions. And so what we have in the United States at the time of the Civil War is we are in this, what they call the end of the medical dark ages. It's the rise of medical science. And so what this means is it's a kind of a hodgepodge all, all across this country of where medicine is at. So you have some practitioners in medicine who are subscribing to things that are centuries, if not millennium, old. These are ideas including what's known as heroic medicine. Heroic medicine is just on its way out in the mid-19th century. Heroic medicine is the idea that you have four humors in your body. You have phlegm, bile of two varieties, yellow and black, and then you have blood. So in this heroic medical ideology, those four humors or substances, fluids in your body are what regulate health and disease and illness. So the idea is, I mean, understandable if you think about it from the perspective of a professional working in this time period, especially in the, in the uh, 18th, 17th, and, and going back in time, they don't have a lot of the technology that we have, the microscopes to be able to, to zoom things in and see things up close. So they're working with what they can see. And what they can see is four substances that can come out of your body at any given time. If you're sick, you have a cold, you have the phlegm coming up, you're coughing up green stuff, it's gross. You have, uh, if you have um, black bile coming out, that's not usually a good sign. This is like blood coming up with, along with um, uh, vomit. Uh, if, you have, if you're vomiting, you also have fluids coming out. And if you poke yourself, cut yourself, you're going to bleed. And so in this idea, heroic medicine, the idea is that these substances that you can see, the doctors can see and, and observe, those must regulate health. This is why in the 18th century, at the end, very end of the 18th century, that George Washington's going to be subjected to bleeding, so much so that it weakens his body enough that he eventually succumbs to uh, his illness. Uh, he, Washington is not alone in that regard. And any time that bleeding comes in, it tends to weaken the patient. But they're working with what they can observe. And so these substances coming out, they thought, must have something to do with balancing those. You need to balance those in order to restore health. We know this to be bunk. We know this to be not the case. But this is what surgeons, what doctors in this time period, in this pre-scientific medical era, this is what they're working with. Luckily for Civil War soldiers, this medical theory is mostly on its way out. And we're starting to see the rise of medical science. And this is not just what you can observe, but their surgeons and, and medical professionals by the 1850s and the 1860s are really starting to experiment. They're starting to test. They're try, trying to see... Uh, working on different, uh, different treatments for illness, working on different theories that might be able to better treat their patients. But they're not there yet because those new revolutions in Europe haven't gotten to the United States yet. They're not going to really be proven until the 1870s and the 1880s. And so American medicine's really at this, kind of everything's up in the air when the Civil War breaks out. Now, one of the dominant theories of medicine during the Civil War time period it's what's known as miasmatic medicine. And what miasmatic medicine shows us is that medicine is in limbo, but they're on the right track. 
And this is the idea, miasma, if you've ever heard that before. Uh, it basically means it's in the air. My, miasmas are, are identified as bad smells. Um, and so doctors in this time period recognize uh, when the Civil War breaks out, you don't want to put your camps in swampy areas. You don't want to put them in areas where there's a lot of sewage or uh, decomposing animal or plant matter because it smells bad. And they identified bad smells with disease and illness and infection. And so we're on the right track. Doctors in this time period are, are moving in the right direction, but they don't yet know what causes disease what causes infection. And that sets the stage for medical care during the war. When the Civil War breaks out, there are probably about 150 to 200 doctors in America who had been military surgeons in their career prior to the outbreak of the war. That means that only 150 to 200 surgeons have any experience with caring for soldiers in, in large numbers. These surgeons are going to end up becoming some of the most professional uh, during the war. These are going to be the ones that are going to become famous during the conflict, um, as famous as Civil War surgeons um, can be, which is, compared to the generals, not very famous. Um, but these are the guys with names like William Hammond, Jonathan Letterman, uh, on the Confederate side, Lafayette Guild. Um, there's a number of, of other Confederate surgeons as well who, who do some incredible work during the Civil War. Um, most of those surgeons who are going to make some inroads, had pre-war military experience. They had treated gunshot wounds before. They had treated some of these illnesses that are going to be associated with soldiers, things like typhoid fever in, in large numbers in, in army camps. Uh, and so those surgeons are going to be the ones who are going to kind of reshape American medical infrastructure during the war. But by and large, most of the surgeons who are actually going to be practicing medicine in the field hospitals of the war about 90% of them, before they go into the service, had never seen a gunshot wound before. So that's uh, one Civil War surgeon estimates, that about 90 to 94% of surgeons who are going to serve in the Civil War in a military capacity had never seen a gunshot wound before they went into the conflict. So if they had never seen these gunshot wounds before, and by the way, of the wounds seen in Civil War hospitals, about 90% of those wounds are going to be from gunshots, this is going to be a problem. And in the first year of the Civil War, as both Union and Confederate side kind of boost up their medical infrastructure, bring men into the army in droves, these civilian surgeons are going to have to learn on the job. And they do a pretty poor job in the first year of the conflict. Now, this is where most of the myths and misconceptions are going to come from when it comes to Civil War medicine. These are the surgeons who are not experienced, who don't know what they're doing. Uh, surgeons who are going to, you know, not really think about what they're doing before they do it, amputating arms and legs, uh, you know, without really thinking about why they're doing it. Um, they're going to be doing it without experience in doing it before. Uh, so things are going to be messy in the first year of the war. There's also no medical infrastructure, no hospitals. At the beginning of the Civil War, the largest Civil War hospital, or the largest military hospital, I should say, was in Kansas. It had 40 beds. It was the largest hospital, military hospital in the United States at the time. There is no ambulance system. Ambulances are controlled by the quartermaster department. And if you know anything about the quartermaster department and the military, they are much more concerned about getting uh, bullets, ammunition, food, things that soldiers need at the front lines. They are much more concerned about that, less concerned about getting medical supplies to the battlefield, and more importantly, removing wounded soldiers from the battlefield and getting them back to hospitals. So the infrastructure, that military medical infrastructure just didn't exist at the outbreak of the American Civil War, and so that's going to have to be created over the course of the conflict. Now, on the battlefield, hospitals are going to change as the war goes on. The infrastructure, the ambulances, stretcher bearers, systems that get wounded soldiers off the battlefield are going to change as the conflict goes on. Ultimately, um, this is going to create some of the, the most important medical infrastructure that we have in this country today. Triage is going to be used for the first time during the Civil War in this country. You're going to have our first organized evacuation system. So 
If you've ever experienced going through uh, being taken in an ambulance, going to a hospital, a medical facility, that system that you went through is the same system that they laid out during the Civil War. So the Civil War helped to create modern emergency medicine in this country. Um, as well as um, it helps to, the, the conflict kind of helps to uh, crystallize and form American medical science as well. So not only are we practicing surgery during the war and doing thousands of amputations, but we're also learning. Civil War surgeons at the top level those surgeons who were there at the outbreak of the war, they recognized the Civil War as a medical opportunity, as an opportunity to learn, as an opportunity to teach, as an opportunity to explore how war affects large populations, how gunshot wounds can be treated differently, how, you know, are we doing too many amputations? Are we not doing enough amputations? This is the kind of thing that they're establishing and working on during, uh, during the war. So what I want to do is, is just kind of take you through the systems that are going to be established during, during the conflict. Um, so one of the, uh, I'm going to go through most of, um, most of the, um, sorry, most of the um, conflict um, what we're going to do is we're going to go through the systems um, that are created to care for these wounded soldiers. So I want to start on the battlefield and talk about some of the uh, ammunition that is used. We're going to talk through um, some of the um, – sorry. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we'll just keep going. Yep, yep, we'll just keep going. All right. Okay, so we're going to carry on. Um, all right. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through the systems, how they worked on uh, soldiers during the conflict. Um, first off, we're going to talk about the battlefield. So let's talk about how surgeons during the war are going to deal with uh, the gunshot wounds, how they're going to deal with all of these wounds on the battlefield. So mo as I mentioned before, most of the wounds that we're going to see during the conflict are caused by bullets. So mini balls. This is a technological innovation that we see uh, in the years and the decades before the Civil War. Um, 58 caliber soft lead bullet. Um, is going to be uh, largely used by both sides during the conflict. Now, this is going to be the largest cause the, of amputations during the conflict. So chances are, if a soldier experienced amputation during the war, it was likely caused by this right here. This small uh, 58 caliber soft lead bullet uh, has this tendency to flatten out when it strikes anything solid. And what this means when it strikes bone is it likes to shatter it. And so that shattered bone is ultimately what is going to um, lead to so many of these amputations being performed. The surgeons at the time, they don't, as I said before, don't understand what causes disease and infection, but they are really good at treating these kinds of injuries and doing amputations. The reason that they are going to be good at those amputations is because they have some new technology available to them. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in just a second. So most of the wounds caused, by, caused during the war are caused by small arms fire, caused by bullets like this one here. Then you also have... Um, Wounds being caused by artillery rounds. This is another of the um, another of the the larger causes of um, causes of injury and ultimately death during the war. Um, so I have two examples here. Um, one of the, them is uh, this small. I say small. It's really heavy uh, iron ball. Uh, this is a piece of canister round. So basically, anti personnel uh, artillery round fired at close range. Um, fired, you can imagine a tin can full of, uh, you know, a dozen of these, um, or in the case where things are getting really desperate for the artillerist, put two tin cans, double your uh, amount of these iron balls. Uh, what these tend to do at close range, and they are used at close range, is they demolish the body. Um, most of the, the soldiers who are going to be struck by canister round 
at close range, not really going to survive to make it back to, to, uh, to hospitals. Um, one of the, uh, one of the, the many stories like this, but artillerists would talk about um, after firing this at close range, we're talking 100, 200, 300 yards max firing this, um, that the smoke would lift after the cannons had fired and there wouldn't be basically anything left of the, of the lines of infantry marching at them. You can see a rising cloud of pink mist coming up. This tore people apart. Similarly to what we have here, which is solid shot had uh, a tendency to do some, some pretty awful things to, to the human body if it struck it. Now, this is pretty heavy. This is going to be fired from a smoothbore cannon. And the way that they would fire these is they'd fire it at pretty low uh, muzzle angle. So what this means is it's going to be fired basically making this into a bowling ball, fired at large numbers of men. Uh, oftentimes in column formation, what this would do against infantry, bounce along. Uh, if it struck home, it could cause some serious damage. Stories of Civil War soldiers seeing one of these rolling along, even at slow speed, put their foot out to stop it, tear it right off. Uh, from our collections at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, we have a letter from Fredericksburg in 1862. A soldier, uh, an officer describes in the regiment ahead of him, he watched from, uh, he was a Union soldier, he watched as a Confederate artillery um, battery fires down on them, firing solid shot. From one of those cannons, he tracks an iron ball coming right towards them. It hits the ranks in front of this officer, the unit ahead, and it hit a soldier square in the chest. He describes what happened next as the soldier being quartered. Literally blew him apart. So this is what these soldiers are dealing with. Now most of the wounds that are going to be seen in the hospital, remember, are caused by mini balls, by bullets, small arms fire. Most of the soldiers that are going to be struck with this kind of ammunition, not going to survive. Um, there is another form of, of artillery ammunition as well. Um, you're going to see is, um, is basically shell fire, shrapnel that would rain down on soldiers from above or explode at the ground at their feet. Um, that also uh, caused more of the survivable injuries um, seen from artillery. But a relatively small percentage of wounds seen from artillery are going to be seen in Civil War hospitals, meaning that most of those that are going to be struck by artillery rounds during the conflict do not survive long enough to make it back to hospitals. So if you're wounded on the battlefield, at the beginning of the war, there is no infrastructure for getting you off the battlefield. Technically, stretcher bearers are designated as musicians before the war. They are not trained for that purpose. Uh, they are these non-combatants in regiments. That's kind of their unspoken rule and responsibility. In some cases, it is spoken, but these musicians, oftentimes kids, are not trained, not prepared to go out onto the battlefield and do dangerous work of bringing off the wounded. So what happens is instead, wounded soldiers, if they are brought off the field, they are brought off by their friends and family serving next to them. Their comrades are the ones that are bringing them off the field. This is problematic from a military perspective. Commanders, especially up, higher up commanders, know that this is a problem because what this means is you're taking able-bodied men off the front lines and you are taking them and bringing them back to these field hospitals, you are taking muskets off the front lines. And so people like Jonathan Letterman, medical director for the Army of the Potomac for most of the war, they're interested in creating a system by which a soldier from the moment they're wounded, they have people who are responsible for picking them up and removing them from the battlefield. And so Letterman in 1862 creates uh, a system for this, it, what becomes known as the Letterman Plan. And this is the first time in American history where we have from the moment a soldier is wounded all the way back to his recuperation and recovery, he has somebody caring for him, somebody who is designated and responsible for bringing them off the field, giving them first aid, giving them surgery or whatever they need in the battlefield hospitals, and then transferring them back to general hospitals for recovery. That system is developed during the war. It is first put into practice at the Battle of Antietam in 1862. That system saves countless lives during the conflict. And so what happens in this system? So a soldier is wounded, let's say, takes a mini ball to the leg. He is going to have stretcher bearers who are designated and responsible for going out and recovering him, 
coming out, picking him up off the battlefield, and taking them to the first step in the Letterman system. That is what's known as a field dressing station, first aid. Right there on the battlefield, two or 300 yards from the front lines, surgeons, assistant surgeons, and hospital stewards, those are the medical personnel in the Army at this time, they're going to give out first aid. Right there on the battlefield, they're going to find a tool that is very important to them. That is going to be the tourniquet. The tourniquet is going to save countless lives during the conflict. The tourniquet, stop bleeding, stop blood loss there. Give the patient a chance to survive. They're putting those tourniquets on. They're giving out opium. Millions of doses of opium going to be given out during the war. In fact, the first opiate crisis in this country is going to develop about 20 years after the conflict. That opiate crisis is going to be caused in part by over-prescription of opiates during the Civil War. Veterans become one of the highest group of addicts after the Civil War time period. You're also going to see the administering of alcohol. Now, this is probably what you think of, right? Yeah, give them a shot of whiskey and chop off their arm. Not the case. They're giving out whiskey at this point as a stimulant. You may say, Jake, alcohol is not a stimulant. It's not what they taught me in school. It's a depressant. In the Civil War time period, they're giving out alcohol as a stimulant in small, incredibly small doses. And this is that initial taste of that beer, that whiskey that you have, and your cheeks get red, and your heart rate comes up a bit. That's the property they're looking for in the alcohol. They're using it as a stimulant to basically treat shock. Um, they don't have a term for that yet. They don't call it shock yet, but that's what they're treating, those symptoms of what we know of today as shock. What ends up happening next, so a patient is at the field dressing station, attach a tourniquet, put them onto an ambulance. Ambulances that are going to take the patient back to the rear a mile or two away to a barn or a field hospital. In those hospitals, that is where surgery is going to be performed. That is where uh, the battlefield medicine that we're going to talk about next in our demonstration, that is where it's going to take place. So I'm going to do some switching around here. We're going to get our patient or our piece of a patient onto the table. And then I'm going to go through and walk through um, what this amputation is going to look like and why they do what they do. Does anybody have any questions at this point while we're switching around? If you do, just shout it out. Okay. Yes. 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 All right, so medical schools in the United States at this at the, the time of the Civil War, um, there were um, over 100 of them um, that had been uh, used, had been, uh, some had closed before the outbreak of the war. Um, there is a process by which you have to go through medical school. Usually two years is, is the time period. Sometimes schools require an apprenticeship. Uh, any surgeon that is going to serve during the war had to go through that medical school process. The reason that there are so small numbers of, of military surgeons because the pre-war U.S. Army only had 16,000 men. And so for that, 150 to 200 surgeons is sufficient. Um, what the war does is it, it, it boosts this infrastructure. So now you're going to have almost 3 million men serve in the armies of the Union and the Confederacy. What this means is you're going to have to boost those numbers of medical professionals to care for them. So in the Union Army, I th I think somewhere between 10 and 15,000 surgeons will serve at some point during the conflict. And a number that's going to be similar on, in, in proportion on the Confederate side. They had to go through medical school. At the beginning of the war, there is no real screening process for medical professionals to say whether or not they are indeed professionals. Um, by 1862 and 1863, there is a pretty rigorous process, at least in the United States Army, uh, to ensure that the, the uh, doctors and surgeons who are coming in are knowledgeable, know what they're doing, and that they are professional. Um, that system gets really developed as the war goes on. Good question. All right, so remember, sawbones.com encased femur. So this is going to be our patient for this evening. If you're wondering why it's such a small table, this is why. I don't have the whole patient. I just have their femur. So what we're going to do is I'm going to walk you through the amputation procedure, how this works, um, why they did what they did, and ultimately how this is going to save countless lives during the war. So we're going to uh, use this 
Encased femur from sawbones.com, we're going to go through the whole process of an amputation. We're going to talk through that process using the tools from the time. So on the table before, I had a surgical kit. This is a reproduction surgical kit um, that has been sharpened for our purposes. Ooh, our patient tried to jump off the table there. Um, this has been uh, sharpened for the occasion. I'd like to thank, um, there's a, a store in... Um, uh, a knife shop in Frederick that sharpened this for free for us, so I'd like to, to thank them uh, for it. Um, so what I'm going to do now is um, kind of talk through how this amputation would have worked. So before we get to actually amputating this leg, um, I do want to say I pointed out that there's a scientific advancement that's made in the, uh, before the war that really changes surgery, and that is going to be Anesthetic. Anesthesia. This is one of the most common misconceptions about the war, that surgeons at the time didn't have anesthesia available to them. In fact, in the 1830s and the 1840s, chloroform and ether are developed and are going to be, by the time of the Civil War, almost universally used in the United States. Chloroform and ether, chloroform discovered in the 1830s, ether first used surgically in the 1840s. It changes everything when it comes to surgery. Before the advent of anesthesia, this is the stories that you get about people biting on things in, in battlefield field hospitals, bite down on a belt or a strap. The reason that they were doing that is because they're trying to amputate as fast as possible. Uh, one of my favorite stories is uh, in the 1820s and the 1830s, before anesthesia in England, there's a surgeon who uh, was one, considered one of the best surgeons in England. Um, he could amputate a, an arm or a leg in a minute or two. Um, one of the fastest surgeons uh, in, in, the, uh, in the West, as they would say. Um, and so what he would do is he was moving so fast because if you gave the patient time to be in agony, they would ultimately die as a result of the pain that they were suffering, uh, complications from shock as well. And so what anesthesia does is it allows to slow things down. Now, I always like to use that example, that guy in England, um, because he has a, a very famous example of a, um, a surgery that went terribly awry and what happens when you're trying to do things really quickly. Um, oftentimes, these surgeries, these amputations pre-war were performed in a theater, You've probably seen this or, or heard of this before, the operating theater, especially in medical schools. They get all the students around to watch. In some cases, they would ask for admission um, so people could pay to go and see a surgery. Um, but one of these surgeons is going to uh, perform one of these very fast amputations on a gangrenous wound. And what he ended up doing is because he was moving so fast, he actually cut his assistant in addition to cutting the patient. And when the knife and the, uh, when the saw hit the table that they were working on, it actually flew out of his hand and hit one of the spectators. All three of those that were hit with the blade died of infection. So this is the danger that you have when you're working so quickly. What anesthesia allows, chloroform and ether, what it allows is for things to slow down. And when you can slow things down, it means you can be much more careful. And when you're more careful, patient has a much higher likelihood of surviving. And so with the advent of anesthesia, 95% of surgeries done during the Civil War are done using anesthesia. Chloroform and ether is used virtually universally. Both Union and Confederates. Confederates build seven labs across the South to manufacture the stuff. That's how important they know it is. They're going to be using it in addition to the Union Army side in virtually all surgeries performed during the Civil War. Now what chloroform and ether allowed is a patient would be rendered, as they called it, insensible. Insensible means they are not fully unconscious. These patients are, in many cases, semi-conscious. They can still move around a bit. Sometimes they can verbalize. They're not making any sense, but they can sometimes, they can be chatty, they can be talking. They can be writhing around as well. So if you see stories of Civil War field hospitals where patients, stay there, buddy, um, where patients are, are uh, soldiers marching by the hospital can see patient is writhing on the table and there's people holding him down, chances are that patient is has been anesthetized, but chances are that dose wasn't high enough to put them into enough of a state of, of stupor that they can't move. Um, and what this means, all of this, whether or not 
and they use chloroform or ether, the patient is not going to remember what happened to them. By and large, they're not going to feel the pain. They're not going to understand what is going on to them. And this allows, because even with the patients writhing around in agony, seemingly, they're not feeling it. But what this means is that this patient uh, is going to go through this process and not be feeling that intense pain and not be going through those symptoms of shock. It allows the doctor to, allows the surgeon to be much more careful. So instead of seemingly what we would do is just in a case where we need to move fast, pre-anesthesia, we would just start sawing through these, th these legs. That is not going to be the case during the Civil War. In fact, surgery is going to become pretty modern as a result of the conflict. So instead of the saw, we're going to go for our scalpel. Um, and we're going to uh, cut an incision. And we're going to have a cut basically mid-thigh, um, which is a, a, a surgery that is pretty dangerous but was pretty common during the conflict. Basically, the lower down your extremity that the wound takes place, the higher the likelihood that you're going to survive uh, an amputation during the Civil War. You get up towards the hip, your likelihood of survival goes down into the territory of about 15%. Yes, sir? More arms or legs? Um, I actually, that's a really great question. I don't have that statistic handy, um, but that's a really good question. I can look it up for you. We can look it up for you at the end. Um, so what we're going to do is perform the circular amputation method. Um, and this form of uh, amputation is going to um, be used commonly during the conflict. Um, I'll show you why it's called the circular method. Um, and this is a method that can still be adopted by surgeons today. Now, I don't have one with me today, um, but what would be important on the upper part of the leg before you provide an amputation? Tourniquet. They're using a tourniquet in every amputation because they understand stopping the bleeding is how you're going to do that. They would have put it above the injury. Of course, that's important to stop the flow of blood into the wound. And so um, there would be a, a tourniquet attached um, up here at the top part, top portion of the leg. So what we're going to do first, scalpel. Scalpel is going to cut through skin. That is all we're going to do in the first step. We're going to cut through the skin and get down to the muscle and the tissue below. They're going to through this. And I have to roll him. Now they had a very spe specific technique for rolling the patient's leg. Um, in this case, they would have had multiple personnel. It would not just be one surgeon doing this. You have two or three surgeons who are going to be assisting in every step of the process to make sure that this goes well, in addition to someone monitoring breathing, monitoring that the patient still has a heartbeat, that you're still working on a live patient, very much in the same way that a surgery would go on today. So once you cut through the skin, what you're going to do then is a Civil War surgeon would actually, and I don't have um, skin on this particular model today, but what, this, what the surgeons would do is they would take the skin that they have and they would actually roll it up. They would roll it up like the, uh, like the coat of a, uh, like a sleeve of a coat is how they would describe it. And the reason that they're doing that is because they want to preserve that in kind of more pristine, of course it's been cut, but more pristine condition, and so that they can pull it over at the end to create a stump. So they're thinking about the very end at the very beginning. And ultimately when they're performing this, they're also thinking about how this limb will fit into an artificial leg. Um, they're thinking about prosthetics right at the very beginning. So they want to make this as comfortable as possible once the patient is going to recover. So once we've cut through the skin, then we're going to go for some of our bigger tools. We're going to go for, eh, what the heck, we'll go for the biggest one. Knives. These specifically are called Catlin knives. Um, and this is what they're going to use to cut through muscle and tissue to get down to bone. Um, and so this is where circular method is going to come really into effect. Let me move my ether cone away there. And so what they're going to do is they're going to go through, and the, the method that they show, have any of you seen this show Mercy Street by any chance? So they actually show this method. Um, being used when they're performing amputation in that uh, PBS hospital drama. But basically what they do is they cut, go into the skin and muscle and tissue, and then they pull it around, get as close to the bone as possible. Again, remember, multiple doctors, surgeons are going to be doing this as well. We're going to get down 
to the bone. All right, pull that away. So what you're going to have now is what's getting physical about these amputation um, amputations that are going to be performed during the war. They are very physical. I'm sweating up here, um, as I'm sure many of you are as well, because it is kind of warm up here. Um, but this is physical hard work. These surgeons had to be strong to be able to do this, because the next step is going to be pretty difficult, and it's going to require a couple of people. So what they would do is they would actually have to go in and pull that excess muscle tissue that had been cut, pull it away. We actually have a little bit more cutting we have to do here. Take one of our smaller Catlins here. Get down. And now I often get asked when I do these about, there is no blood associated with this in, in this demonstration. Um, there would be blood in these wounds, but it's not a, an immense amount of blood because if you had that, you'd have serious problems. Um, lots of hemorrhage means lots of problems. So, so we're going to pull this away. Physical hard work here. These surgeons would have to perform. All right. And what we're trying to do is create a channel. And through that channel, it's going to go the saw. So the moment you've all been waiting for. So this is probably the, the most accurate part, um, is the sound of this demonstration. Um, so prepare for that if you're going to record any of this for social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, this is the time you'll want to do it. So now we're going to actually amputate this leg. Exactly like cutting wood. All right, so we're through the, through the uh, bone. We have a little bit of muscle tissue there we have to get. All right. And our amputation is complete. Now, have you heard that snap? It means I'm... Not a really great surgeon. <laughs> These surgeons by 1862, 63, many of them are very professional. Um, have any of, you, uh, any of you heard of the uh, discovery at Manassas National Battlefield, of a bone pit, amputated limb pit? So what those bones show, there were about 10 uh, limbs found, amputated limbs. By zooming in, with modern photographic technology, you could actually see each of the strokes of the blade through the bone. And what that showed, the very end, there wouldn't have been a snap. It would have been a very careful, deliberate motion to end the amputation in a way that did not harm the patient and created a much nicer, smoother uh, bone piece for a stump to be created. Those surgeons were expert, much more expert than myself. Um, but what those surgeons did is something very similar to what I just did. So what do we do with the, the limb that we've just cut off? Yeah, if I could, these windows didn't have grates, I'd toss it out onto the street. Um, they did just throw them out windows, put them outside barns. Most of these hospitals are in barns at the beginning of the conflict. Eventually, later on, they decide that's not a good idea anymore, and they're going to start operating in tents, lots of fresh air. Um, I remember, they're thinking about miasmatic medicine, so they're thinking about fresh air is important. They want clean air. They don't want bad smells associated with places like barns. And these limbs would pile up, in some cases up to... Uh, second story windows, um, pretty grotesque scenes outside these hospitals. As for our patient, so considering we still have a whole other patient here, um, the next step would be um, you're going to go into your kit, you're going to take out a bone brush, you're going to clear out the uh, shards of bone because it's just like cutting wood. You are going to have the, the pieces of bone that are going to come off. You also have in your kit, 
In addition to the brush, you have a file. So what you're going to do is going to file down the end of the bone. Make sure it's smooth, as smooth as possible. And then what you're going to do, you go back into your kit. And you get some of these tools in there because you're going to need to go in and pull out every one of those major blood vessels running through the leg. And you're going to have to tie them off. So going in, pulling each one of those out, double knotting them to make sure that there's not going to be any, any break of, of that, uh, that blood vessel so it doesn't burst, doesn't cause uh, more hemorrhage into the wound. That's what you want to avoid. And then ultimately you're going to peel that skin back down, roll it back down, tuck it over the entire thing, over the entire stump that you are creating, and then you're going to very loosely, very loosely, sew everything closed. Now the reason you sew everything closed because all through the surgery, the very beginning to the very end, doctors are using unwashed hands, unwashed instruments. Everything is uncleaned. If you are in the hospital and you're the 60th patient treated, you have 60 patients, other fluids, in addition to the doctors who are working on you, on those tools, in your wounds. Virtually every wound during the war is going to become infected. And so what, at the very end, the, the surgeon is doing by loosely closing that wound is they're going to allow it to drain. So we have good infections and bad infections during the war. Good infection, nice and clear fluid coming out. Bad infections, gangrene, amongst others, is going to uh, lead to fluids coming out that are green, yellow, black. Not a good sign. Um, but because, whoo, <laughs> dropping surgery, right? Yep. Now I am a, a victim, I could be a victim of gangrene. Um, basically what this, what this means is these surgeons, while they have the knowledge of how to do this in a modern fashion and the technique that they use is still going to be used today, they, the, the lack of knowledge of cleanliness is going to lead to the deaths of thousands of their patients that they would, in modern times, have survived because we understand the knowledge of cleanliness and cleaning out these wounds. But these surgeries save countless lives during the conflict. Um, 60,000 again, surgeries are going to be performed. Um, what's pretty remarkable when you look at the numbers, if you look at these sur uh, surgeries that are performed, these amputations that are performed, uh, if you received treatment within 24 to 48 hours, received an amputation, you had a 75% likelihood of surviving. Pretty, pretty impressive, considering. Now, where you're wounded really dictates how, likelihood you, how likely you're going to be to survive. Fingers and toes amputated. You have 95 to 98% chance of surviving. You get down to, get closer to the core of the body, much higher risk of complications. Amputated the hip, 15% chance of surviving. Shoulders. You have 25% chance of surviving. So the closer you get to the core of the body, the higher the risk uh, that the patient is going to face. And the closer you get to the core, uh, the more uncomfortable the surgeons would feel actually operating at all. Um, what you see is wounds very close to the hip, very close to the shoulder. In the cases of, of very busy battlefield hospitals, in that levels of triage that they're going to have during the war, many times those are the kinds of patients that would be set aside, given painkillers, and then they would operate them on the, at the end where they would have more time to be more deliberate, more careful to ensure that they get better. But at the end of all of this, all of those amputations that are going to take place, what this leads to is a rise in the modern prosthetics industry. Prosthetic limbs become a boom industry as a result of the conflict because there are tens of thousands of amputees in this country as a result of the war. And there are going to be army contracts that are going to be given out uh, to give soldiers the best limb possible. Um, there are going to be providers uh, doing battle to create the most modern limb that provides patients with the most mobility, with the most normalcy. And so it creates a, an entirely way of thinking about disability in this country. Pre-war America, if you had some fault in your body, if you, if you, had, a, a, if you had an amputation performed and did not have a, a, a working, functioning arm or leg, you were 
removed from the community. You did not have a, a place in the community. You were looked at as an outcast. But because these tens of thousands of, of otherwise able young men are coming home maimed by war, disabled by war, it forces a, a, a new look at disability in this country. And those prosthetic limbs are going to, uh, going to help provide some normalcy, um, but they're just one way that America's, Americans are trying to uh, grapple with some of this loss. Yes, sir? Yes, and this is not, you know, the what's interesting that the northern side of this is going to the federal government is going to provide um, pensions um, and also provide in many cases limbs. What's interesting is in those southern states is because of their war-torn economies, um, you start to see startling statistics like that. And you're going to see similar similar statistics in places like Mississippi as well. Of these state governments that are going to be required, um, who are trying to provide for the soldiers that fought for those states during the conflict, there are so many of these men coming home that it becomes this over, overwhelming amount and number of prosthetic limbs that are going to have to be given out. So I want to thank you all for coming out this evening. Um, I would love to answer any questions that you might have. Um, and thank you so much for coming out. And uh, um, yeah, would love any questions and would love for all of you to come to the museum. All right.